the NBA Draft. The day where 60 college or international players get chosen by a team for the chance of becoming an NBA player and start their career in the best basketball league in the world. Over the years, the discussion of draft classes are always a fun topic to debate on, whether one turned out better or worse than another. And today, as we now go into the early stages of the 2000s, 20s decade, I think it's time to take a look back at the 2000s, 10s decade once again and make a tier list to see how the 2000s, 10s decade of draft classes stack up with each other and see which ones are better, worse, or even at the same level as each other. And the main things we'll look forward to in this video is the variation of different things. All-star appearances, award winners, all NBA appearances, category leaders, the works because we really got to see how these classes ended up competing in the grand scheme of things and the tests of time. But before we start, if you want to see more videos like these, be sure to like the video to show support and subscribe to be notified when new videos come out. And if you want to see me do the same thing for the 2000s draft class this summer, let's get this video to 1000 likes and I'll be sure to make it happen. But as usual, this will be a long one, but you already know who it is. Well, it Three, two, one. The 2010 NBA Draft Class. Coming into the draft, it was ruled by Blue Blood Schools. With almost the entire starting lineup of the Kentucky Wildcats going in the first round and two Kansas Jayhawks being taken in the first. But when it comes to the top of the draft, everyone had a good idea who was going to be taken first. And it was going to be John Wall from the Kentucky Wildcats, where he would be taking the torch from the injury riddled and damaged Gilbert Arenas. But at the same time, he was thought to be the best prospect overall in the draft, taking the college ranks by storm. And while he was one of the only people who really impressed in a rookie season, he would turn his hype coming out of Kentucky into a star studded prime with the Washington Wizards, averaging 19 points, 9 assists, and almost 2 steals a game. He is joined by other players in the class who would end up blooming later in their careers and future All Star stars and DeMarcus Cousins who would terrorize the 2010s even if it was short-lived as one of the most offensively versatile big men we've seen at the time while at his best he was averaging 27 points 10 rebounds and five uh. assists a game Gordon Hayward who would only get one all-star appearance in the NBA where in that season he would average 21 5 and 3 on godly efficiency with the Utah Jazz and finally probably undisputably the best player coming out of this draft class when it comes to career outlook the 10th pick of the 2010 class Paul George. Coming into the NBA, he would immediately be given a big role on the Indiana Pacers as they was trying to go after a potential championship with then star Danny Green. But as Danny would consistently get more and more injured, he would become what John Wall was destined to become with the Wizards. The young star with aspirations to carry the team for years and years to come. And that's exactly what he would become as George averaging a career best with Indiana at the time. 23 points, 6 rebounds, and 3 assists a game. But his story doesn't end there with his second stint in OKC, where he would be considered a whole MVP at one point, leading the NBA in steals in the 18-19 season, and now playing right now on the Clippers, still being a top shooting guard candidate in the NBA and going after a championship. But the class doesn't end there when it comes to contributors who make up the entirety of the 2010s class. These two players may not have been all-stars, but at one point they were considered to be the next up until they didn't meet their potential. Firstly, we have the two-time block leader who was brought into the NBA scene, mainly known for this funny clip in a post-game interview. Meet Hassan Whiteside, the 33rd pick of the 2010 draft. His career didn't turn into much after he was drafted by the Kings in the second round, but it picked up by the Heat four years later after he was drafted. But when the Heat found was a player who became the most fiercest block artist in the NBA, leading the NBA twice in blocks per game, where at his highest he averaged 3.7 and even averaged an NBA high 14.1 rebounds a game in the 2016-17 season. And lastly, we have the 18th pick of the 2010 draft. Eric, he got muscles for no reason, Bledsoe. As a late first round pick, sometimes you need to wait around to make your mark in the NBA and he got his chance to do that in the league. When he was traded to the Phoenix Suns when his tenure, he would average 18 points, six assists, and five rebounds a game. But at the same time, he made his impact known on the defensive side, being a two-time all defensive team member but as you can imagine if you know much about this class it was mainly top heavy in impact and achievements in the league only producing four all-stars three all nba players and most surprisingly 
four all defensive team members in Paul George, Hassan Whiteside, John Wall, and Eric Bledsoe. And outside of producing some really decent starting level talent in like George Monroe and Derek Favors, the 2010 class is mainly known for one thing when it comes to their stars career ending oh. injuries as we know john wall was never the same after tearing his achilles after legit falling in his own home the rocker's cousin sustaining an injury in new orleans that started his downfall gordon hayward breaking his leg after signing a new deal with the boston celtics and of course paul george breaking his leg in the team usa scrimmage after making his second straight all-star team when it comes to the stars this group of all-star talent would have been a lot better off on this list if it wasn't for that and for the two guys who couldn't even make the all-star status it's on white side simply fizzled out of the league after leaving Miami and Eric Bledsoe had his reputation ruined around the league after his stint in the playoffs with his time in Milwaukee. Even as the first draft class in this video with the best chance to be the highest due to their time spent in the league, compared to other classes we will talk about, the 2010 class will end up with a B in the average category. This class has some real generational talent in John Wall, Marcus Cousins, and PG. When you receive a career-ending injury that tanks your career, it already makes a pretty skinny draft class with a lot of middling role players and not a lot of starters look even less impressive. But I'll be fair in the case that we do have to think about the best of these guys' careers and the accolades they created during that time, but we also have to talk about the future of their career. Some of you may disagree, but as we get further into this video, you'll only understand exactly what I mean by that. In the 2010 NBA draft class, I showed you an example of how talent in a class can die out and make for an overall mid or underwhelming draft class. But the next year, the 2011 class, we have something people would call the standard or what people think the average draft class should be, even though we know it's not going to be this way. But at the same time, let's start off with the undisputed first overall pick and the most talented player coming into the class, Kyrie Irving from Duke, who, even though having an injury that only allowed scouts to see him play 11 games, still gave scouts a good idea of just how good Kyrie Irving can be as a point guard in the NBA with his mix of handles, finishing, and a clean jumper. And as we all know, after 11 years in the NBA, he has gone on to become one of the best point guards of this era, eight-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA member, and of course, his most important feat, a one-time NBA champion helping his team come back from a three-to-one deficit. And we still is playing in the NBA to this day, staying a top five point guard in the NBA and averaging 23 points a game since his first All-Star season in the NBA at 31 years old. He still has plenty of time to make more accolades in the NBA, but as the number one overall pick, you can still call his time in the NBA very much a success outside of his off-court stuff. But what if I told you that he is debatably not even the best player of his class? To most people, that belongs to the 15th pick of the class, Kawhi Leonard, who in his time in the NBA is a two-time Finals MVP with the Spurs and Raptors, a two-time Defensive Player of the Year as a small forward, five-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA, and one of the best playoff performers of all time who's known for one of the best game winners in playoff history. It's off to Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? But even as classes goes, you still have two players who've won championships and taken over 2010. But what about the 11th pick of the class, who's been a main component in one of the best basketball dynasties of all time, in Clay Thompson of the Golden State Warriors, a five-time All-Star, four-time NBA champion, and a two-time All-NBA member, who is currently 11th all-time and made three-pointers. This class continues to be full of all-star type of talent who has eventually found their rhythm late in their careers. Nikola Vucevic, a two-time all-star, became a staple with the Orlando Magic for many years. Kevin Walker, a one-time all-star who became the face of Charlotte basketball for the longest time, and it doesn't even end there. With the 30th pick of the draft, you have Jimmy Butler, who even though has had an interesting career so far being moved from team to team with his time with the Bulls, he has still gained a plethora of accolades, being a six-time all-star, four-time All-NBA member and a five-time all-defensive team member and last but not least in this class the 60th pick of the 2011 draft class isaiah thomas who at one point gave us one of the best stories in the nba is a five foot nine scoring machine leading the boston celtics for a two-year span averaging 25 points and six assists a game with two all-star appearances himself so overall with the top end talent they account for seven all-stars six all ba members multiple championships and three all defensive team members with Kawhi leading the pack 
with seven appearances on his own. But even if you want to stop talking about the high-end talent, there's still plenty of depth to go around just to show how deep this class was. With a bunch of notable starters and Tobias Harris, Bojan Bogdanovic, Jonas Valanciunas, Tristan Thompson, and I'm not even going to keep talking about the rest of them because the list just goes on. When it comes to this class though in this video, however, this class truly has it all. A top tier first overall pick who was justified in being there in the first place in Kyrie Irving, multiple lottery picks who challenged the first overall pick in accolades and could even say had a better career than him in Klay Thompson and Kawhi Leonard, even more all-star talent who bloomed later in their careers in Nikola Vucevic and Jimmy Butler who are seeing right now leading an eighth seeded team over the first seeded Bucks and is challenging to make the conference finals over the Knicks and has a finals appearance under his belt as a sole best player and even their 60th pick who if it wasn't for injuries could have continued being a viral threat in the NBA in Isaiah Thomas. The 2011 draft class deserves a lot of flowers for all the all-around prospect it produced, whether it be American-made, from overseas, early picks, late picks, second-round picks, it has it all. And accolades to boot to only make their case stronger, which is why I'll be awarding them with the top placement so far in this video in the S tier. It truly doesn't get better than this, but as we go further in the classes, we might see a few who can contend with the depth and star power this class has. The 2012 NBA Draft. Coming into the class day one, a lot of scouts and experts didn't see a lot of upside from players outside of the top five unanimous go-to prospects. And that was mainly due to the class being full of four-year college guys or older talent who, as we always discuss, aren't always seen as valuable due to the timetable not being in their advantage compared to their 18 or 19 year old counterparts, especially considering how they have to produce quickly or risk being a bad draft pick due to that. But in the top five, two of the five guys would stand out almost immediately as players who would define the class out the gate. First, as we all know, the unanimous prize of the 2012 draft class, Anthony Davis, who coming in was coming off of a monster year at Kentucky, breaking shot blocking records and showing his all around game that scouts salivated at to try to turn him into a one of a kind center who can take other bigs off the dribble, have range all around the arc, and of course his most appealing trait, his Hall of Fame worthy defensive vitals. And in his time in the NBA, he has been what people have expected of him to be for the most part. But as we all know, a good majority of his career has been wasted in New Orleans, making the playoffs only twice in seven seasons, and in both cases were in the bottom half of the conference and only making it as far as the second round. But as we all know, the career narrative for AD would change after he'd go to LA and win a championship in LA in his first season, and is currently threatening to make another finals run in the conference finals right now, going against Denver. Overall, as the undisputed best player in the class, he owns eight all-star appearances, four NBA nods, a four-time all-defensive member, a three-time block champion, and of course, a one-time NBA champion. But the class continues to have more reputable players, but as stated before, the third spot you already know was a young player who would immediately show promise in Bradley Beal. Now, I gotta admit it, he isn't even top three when it comes to the best players in this class, but as a three-time All-Star and a two-time 30-point-per-game scorer, which only 16 other players have ever done in NBA history, he still deserves consideration in this stat class. But for the other two best players in the class, at least in my opinion, that goes to the sixth pick of the class, Damian Lillard, and the 35th pick of the class, and one of the best second-round picks of all time, Draymond Green. For Damian and Draymond, their story is relatively similar as for your college players looking to make their mark in the league. But for Damian Lillard as one of the best guards in the college ranks, taking advantage of a weaker guard class, was able to come in to a deteriorating Sparrow Blazers team and become their franchise guard in a few seasons, leading them to many playoff appearances and becoming a seven-time All-Star, six-time All-NBA, and a top 75 player of all time, according to the NBA. And for Draymond as a four-year player at Michigan State, he was drafted in the second round due to his many question marks as an NBA player. But due to an injury to David Lee and his utilization as a Swiss Army knife in Golden State by Steve Kerr, he was able to become one of the best role players of all time. A defensive player of the year winner and owner of eight all-defense selections, four all-star appearances, four-time NBA champion, and a two-time All-NBA player. But even when you get out of the top three, there's still plenty of players who became All-Stars in their own way, like Andre Drummond, the four-time rebounding champion, and Chris Middleton, a one-time champion and a three-time All-Star. Outside of that, again, like I said, you have a huge gap in talent with only a few starter-level players in the first round. For example, the 2012 starters here with the most consistent job in the NBA the past couple of seasons has been Harrison Barnes. So when it comes down to the ranking of this 
class, I think it's fair to give this class a, a ranking. I think it is certainly safe to not put them in the S tier due to the lack of their class and the only having three clear Hall of Fame worthy players in the future, but I definitely don't think they deserve to be in B just yet, having a clear leg up on the class that will end up later in this video. The 2013 NBA class, the most controversial class that we will talk about probably in this video. And again, after how I spoke about how scouts found the 2012 class to be weak coming into the draft, the sentiment for the 2013 class was that times 10, because for the first time in a long time, no one had any idea who could have gone first overall in the draft undisputably. And while this isn't a video to talk about all the failures in that class, where the average draft to career time in this class is five years currently, which is barely over the average of an NBA career, which is 4.5 years, you can already have a good idea where this class is going. But let's at least talk about the bright spots of this class as of 10 years later. From the top, we have the second pick of the class in Victor Oladipo, going to Orlando Magic, where he was mainly a defensive specialist coming out of Indiana, but had two-way potential with an all-around game if worked correctly. But as we slowly saw him develop in the NBA sphere, being one of the best players off the gate in the class, his time wouldn't come until after he moved from two teams, from Orlando, then to OKC to play with Russell Westbrook, then to Indiana, where we'd see Victor finally get his own team. And as we all know, during his time in Indiana, the Pacers fandom couldn't be mad at the trade initially, as they gave up Paul George for a player who ended up leaving off of where he left off, averaging 23 points, leading the NBA in steals, becoming an All-NBA member, and getting two All-Star appearances. But as we all know, his rise came crashing down just as fast, getting injury after injury after injury, and becoming a former shell of himself due to it. Even now in 2023, he just sustained another bad injury with the Heat during the playoffs, but only at 31, he still has some time to have a full career in the NBA. Then as we all know at 15, one of the most unlikely superstar stories started when Giannis Antetokounmpo was drafted. From skinny project player to one of the most dominant forces in the NBA since Shaq, Giannis in this current age is known as a player who can contend for the top power forward position of all time if he simply keeps gaining accolades and garnering championships. He already has two MVPs, one finals MVP, one time DPOY, five time all defense, seven all stars. The accolades only keep continuing to get bigger and bigger as he continues to dominate this class. But as the clear and undisputed best player in his class, who can even be considered his second best classmate to even try to help this class in the sense of retrospect going against nine other draft classes? Well, the only person who can even try to contend is Rudy Gobert, the 27th pick of the draft. Now, in the NBA sphere, people may call him overrated, but when we look at accolades and see what he's done in the league so far, we cannot deny that he's one of the best paint defenders of our modern age, with three DPOY awards, which puts him in the same club as Dwight Howard, Ben Wallace, and the Kembe Matumbo. Alongside his three all-star appearances and four all-NBA appearances, he does have the accolades to carve himself a spot in NBA history, at least for his defense. But after that, yeah, this class is pretty bare of talent. And when I say talent in this case, I mean all-stars or fringe all-stars, where the only other person you can speak of in this class is CJ McCollum, who even in his heyday with Portland never got a single award outside of the most improved player award. From there, it's full of starters, but even then that's pretty bare, but Let's just get to the part everybody's waiting for and the part that everybody knows is coming, D tier. Complete bottom. Not even one of the best players of our modern age can help this class get out of the gutters, but that's mainly due to how bad all around is with barely any sustainable NBA talent that made real careers in the league. I mean, this shouldn't have been obvious, but I, I have to at least make a case somehow. After the thought to be disappointments of the last two classes, we move along to the 2014 NBA draft class. And that was thought to have some real heavy hitters who were thought to be superstars in the league. And while some of them didn't necessarily hit the marks for one reason or another, whether it be Jabari Parker's constant injuries or Andrew Wiggins being an underwhelming first overall pick in the eyes of NBA fans everywhere, the third overall pick of this class is where we start off a more than deep draft class. And as we all know, the third overall pick of this class was Joel Troel MB, who even though came in with a foot injury that would leave him out for his first two NBA seasons, Scout saw something in the Cameroonian I don't even think that's how you pronounce that. Wait a minute. Okay, it actually is how you say that. That screamed superstar. And that's exactly what he became. In his first seven years in the NBA so far, he already has seven all-star appearances, 
five all NBA placements, a three time all defensive team member, and as of recently has grown into the realm of all time Hall of Fame talent, garnering two scoring titles in back to back seasons, and now in the 2023 season is a MVP winner. How does he pull this off? While well, being one of five centers ever to average 30 points in the season, joining Moses Malone, Wilt Chamberlain, Bob McAdoo, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all Hall of Famers, all all-time talent, and all immortalized in NBA history. And with his knockdown jumper, dominance in the paint, and knack for garnering fouls, which is a you know quality I don't like about him, he will only garner more and more accolades barring injury, and might be able to stack a few championships on that road. Not this season though, rip bozo. But what this class has that rarely any other class does is two MVP winners in the same class, where the last one to ever have one since 2014 class was in 09 with Stephen Curry and James Harden. But in the 2014 class, we have Joel Embiid winning an MVP this year, and the 41st pick of the class, Nikola Jokic, who already has two of them. Coming into the NBA as a second round pick, Jokic was doubted due to his slowness and non-agile nature. But as his European-centered game slowly gotten better and better, his dominance only grown. And his career so far shows for itself. A five-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA member, and again, a two-time MVP, while also having the six most triple doubles in NBA history. These two absolutely made the class what it is now, and these two will only continue their bouts of dominance and could even potentially garner more MVPs. But one thing I'm sure we all want to see them is face each other off at the biggest stage in the NBA Finals for the spot of top big men, or have a generational battle for supremacy like Bill Russell had with Wilt Chamberlain. But getting away from that, you already know this class has other all-stars all over the class. Andrew Wiggins got a starting spot last year, even though a lot of us didn't agree with that. Julius Randle joins Embiid and Jokic as the only other All-NBA member with two of them and a two-time All-Star, and Zach Levine also owns a pair of All-Star selections. But even a level down from that, the class continues to show how great it is over time when it comes to top-tier role players and statistical greatness. This class has a DPO wide winner in Marcus Smart, a rebounding champion in Clint Capella, a Sixth Man of the Year winner in Jordan Clarkson, and plenty of top-tier role players all over the league but when it comes down to the hard part where does this class rank on the tier list you have two mvps that share a draft class together and a few other all-stars in there but compared to the 2011 class with four guarantee hall of famers in the future is it safe to compare them together for now i think it's safe to do so as they have pretty similar quality talent when it comes to superstar talent amazing depth from all angles and safe to say even future champions as they continue to keep playing so i think it is safe to say that they can share a tier together in the s spot with 2011 but if you say that a is appropriate i wouldn't blame you for thinking that way Coming into the 2015 NBA Draft, we have another situation where scouts were not the highest on a lot of the players in the draft itself and its depth. Unlike in some classes where they are praised for their potential all-star level talent even outside of the top 10, some classes don't have the luxury, and the 2015 class is certainly one of them. But to its credit, it does have a rifle and worthy first overall pick that was guessed to go there on most draft boards, and that person was Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns was thought to be the first center coming into the NBA, or at least through the draft, to change the position of the center spot towards its current trajectory. Being able to take other centers off the dribble, have the potential to increase his range to the three-point line, and of course, being able to bang bodies in the paint and defend the paint as a seven-foot, 250 pound center and to his credit as one of the best players in the class he has absolutely defended his first overall placement by being a three-time all-star and a two-time all-nba member but outside of that he is struggling in more ways than one to help his own legacy due to a lack of actual success as a team and at the moment his lack of playoff success has been a main demerit to his reputation around the league as he's only been to three playoff appearances and only won four games in that time most of this is on himself though as in his time in the playoffs so far he's had a bad tendency to disappear in the light to the brightest and of course his franchise and the wolves weren't exactly the best at bringing him talent outside of the draft but even as he still starts off to represent this draft class there's still a player who has eclipsed him as the best player in the draft as he is still drafted in the lottery in Devin 
Booker. Devin Booker right now is considered as one, if not the best shooting guard in the NBA, and he has come a long way for that title. Being forced to learn early how to lead a team while his team in the Suns has some dark days before now, and of course, learning the NBA game as a guard. But as he got better and better, his team eventually got better and better itself, his reputation around the league started to shift, and at the age of 26 so far, he's already led his team to a finals appearance. Been to three All-Star games, and has been represented as one of the best players in the NBA, on the all nba team once and lastly as one of the biggest questions in the draft at the time with the fourth pick in the class we have chris stats porzingis who even though booed and heckled at draft night was able to come in immediately to the city of new york and show the nba that the slight seven foot frame that he has was able to dominate in the NBA given some time. And already owning an all-star appearance in his third year as a pro, the sky was perceived to be the limit for him as the new eighth center, just like his classmates, Carl Anthony Towns. But as we all know, as injuries would start to pile up and more and more failed situations continue to occur, Chris Stapp's name in the NBA sphere has become more and more quiet. But at least now, after the 2023 season, we're starting to see a little bit of a redemption era after his time in Dallas, putting up career best in Washington scoring line. And also, you do have to consider other flash in the pan people like Chris Stapps and D'Angelo Russell who at one point was seen as the next big guard after his breakout season in Brooklyn where he would earn his one and only all-star appearance but is now used as an above average starting point guard but the optimism in this class stops there as the more and more you look at this class the more and more you notice the names that had big name potential but didn't work out at all from there the players with accolades are only limited to a two-time block leader Miles Turner who has yet to get an all defense appearance despite that and weirdly enough a six man of the year winner of Montrez Harrell and then poof nothing more you can argue that maybe with time the narrative of this class will change but as of the time of right now in this video only 17 players with real roles in the NBA are from this class 15 players who didn't even play in the NBA in this class also reside here and many, many more failed NBA careers in the ranks alongside them. So when it comes down to ranking them, where would you put them? You have a class currently with only one debatable Hall of Fame level talent and a few all-stars sprinkled in. One who can make it year after year if he wanted to and two who only made it once to not then be on that same level playing wise anymore. Then from there, you have a few memorable players, a lot of busts, and again, one of the worst classes when it comes to producing NBA players players in general. To some, this might be a surprise, but for the time being, this class got to be alongside the 2013 class in the C tier. One of the worst. Now, obviously, you can argue it isn't as bad as 2013, like that's obvious, but when it comes down to the entirety of the class, it is super lackluster, just like it. So instead of being at the complete bottom, you get to be one tier on top of it. But maybe some time will tell and we'll get a few more surprises over the years, but I highly doubt it. Once again, going into the 2016 class, we're coming off of a class that wasn't the most hyped in 2015. But one year later, we were graced with a class with perceived all-time potential wrapped all around in one way or another. And it started off with one of the most interesting prospects we have ever seen in the draft in the 6'9", 240-pound beast who played point guard, by the way, Ben Simmons. Now, this isn't a video where I tear into Ben. I've done that plenty of times on the span of this channel. But considering this is a ranking of draft classes, let's consider the good of Ben just for this one video. Can you do that with me? Like, I'll, I'll, it'll be hard for me too, but just, just bear with me. Coming into the NBA off his more than impressive campaign at LSU, Ben was labeled with the potential in the stratosphere of LeBron James with his ball handling skills and IQ, or even a Magic Johnson due to his play style if he trained himself to that level. But after his one year where he went to heal after his season in the injury in his true rookie season, he'd go ahead and show the world that he was trying to take over the NBA. And with his time with the 76ers, that's exactly what he would try to do, being a great facilitator for his team, a dominant presence in the paint, and one of the best defenders in the NBA, being a finalist for the DPOI, and even leading the NBA in steals in the 1920 season. And in that span in Philly, he'd go on and get three all-star appearances, two all-defensive nods, and even an all-NBA appearance in 2020. But as we all know, things would slow down for him due to his controversies and injury troubles after touching down in Brooklyn. We all hope he can bounce back physically and mentally because he has a lot more to show the NBA and a lot of haters to prove wrong me included. But even outside of that, there is plenty of all-star level talent spread around the 2016 class. So let's go in in order. The second pick of the class in Brandon Ingram was a player who was thought to have a KD-like game with his KD-like frame and ability to score at will. 
Only problem was he was way too skinny for his own good coming into the NBA and not as skillful as KD when he came into the league. For reference, KD averaged 20 points off the jump in Seattle while Brandon struggled due again to his skinny ass frame. So once again, he got away from the LA Lakers to be able to get his own team in the New Orleans Pelicans where he started to ball out year after year to be a perennial 24 point per game scorer and even a one time all-star so far. But due to team success, his name isn't really up there, but time will fix that but we'll talk about the person bringing them down later. With the third pick, you have Jalen Brown, an uber athletic shooting guard who needed to work on his shot creation skills at the next level and had the potential to be one of the best two-way players in the league. And with five years time, he turned into exactly that and an all-star. And with a few more years after that under his belt, he would lead a Boston Celtics team to their first finals in a while, earned another all-star appearance and just got inducted into the 2023 all NBA second team. So you know his resume will only grow with time itself. And at the 11th spot, we have DeMontis Sabonis, who would get his claim and prominence in Indiana after being traded for Paul George, where he went and developed into one of the best passing big men in the NBA, a double-double, or even sometimes a triple-double threat every night, and now with the Kings, a all NBA member, and a three-time All-Star and this current season's rebounding champion. Even outside of the lottery, you still have Pascal Siakam and DeJounte Murray, who both took some time to truly become the young stars that they are. With Pascal winning MIP in his third season in the NBA and then becoming an all-star twice, winning all NBA twice, and of course, being a very vital part of a championship run as a one-time champion. And for DeJounte, being in the Spurs development camp usually yields results, and he's no exception, becoming an all-around threat growing year by year until he took over the starting point guard spot in San Antonio, where he turned into an all-star, became a steals champion last year, and is leading a very promising career right now. Sucks it's with Trey Young in Atlanta, but hey, game is game. But even outside of that all-star study cast, you still have a list of other characters in there. Six Man of the Year, Malcolm Brogdon, one of the best shooters in the NBA, Buddy Heald, and fringe all-star, Jamal Murray. And with these guys now in their prime, being mostly in their mid to late 20s, there's plenty of time for this class to create some accolades for themselves and rank themselves higher. But for now on the tier list, when it comes to accomplishments and overall draft composition, I think it's safe to say A for right now is a nice placeholder. But who knows, if over the years, if, if people in this class and go for championships, more All-NBA appearances, and the like, this class could be up there with the 2011 ranks an all-time greatness. It's too early to say now for obvious reasons, but for what they have achieved for now, A is the perfect spot for now, and S is the all-time potential for this class. In a video I made almost half a year ago, I called the 2016 high school basketball class one of the best we've seen in our modern time. And the points I made in that video only confirm more and more just how good that class transitioned in the NBA with over 80% of the first round being freshman talent looking for a place in the NBA. But the one who went number one overall to represent the class ended up being the electric and dominant Markel Fultz, who was thought to have superstar talent the way he took over the college ranks. Unfortunately, as we know, you'd have an interesting journey in the NBA with mysterious injuries and even a shoulder injury that caused him to forget his own jump shot and have to start back from scratch in that area of basketball, among other things. But now in Orlando, he is currently building himself back up to be potentially back to his thought to be projection. But even even with that weird career of Markel Foles, the 2017 class has talent all around that would overshadow one of the weirdest number one overall picks of all time. So let's start off with the most successful player in this class right now in Jason Tatum of the Boston Celtics. He, just like other ways to go with the ball on the ground and create their own shot with ease, was thought to have unlimited potential as a player. Offensively, defensively, playmaking, didn't matter. If he wanted to do it, he definitely could with time. And all it took was his breakout season, his third year at 21 years old, to average 23 points a game and to show that he was looking to take over the NBA. And at the age of 25, already a four-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA member, an All-Star MVP, and already led his team to the NBA Finals. And even now is the holder of the highest point-per-game average ever in a Boston Celtics jersey in a season. But as he is going to eventually be fighting for year to year for supremacy in the NBA, he will of course be stacking on more accolades throughout his young and dominant career. But the all NBA talent does not end there, nowhere near. Joining him in the fifth spot, 
we have De'Aaron Fox, who for the first time makes an All-NBA team after dealing with years of years of struggle with the Sacramento Kings. And as a slight plug, you can watch the complete history of their 16 years of missing the playoffs here if you would like to know about how much shit he'd have to go through in his young career. But Fox has always been one of the better point guards in the NBA, in my opinion, but he has patiently been waiting for a core to be built around him to take over the NBA. And finally, in his sixth season, he was able to reach the status of All-Star, made an All-NBA team in the third team this year, and be the first winner of the NBA's Clutch Award. Now listen, if you don't take that award seriously, believe me, I don't either. But someone who's already had a more impressive NBA career over Fox has been the 13th pick of this draft, Donovan Mitchell, who as soon as he hit the NBA ranks, was able to average 20 points a game and lead his team to five straight playoff appearances and continuously be an all-star. But now with the Cavaliers, who's able to reach the status of his first all-NBA appearance after being shafted in that side of the game, averaging a career high 28 points a game and logging in the eighth most points in the NBA game with 71 being up there with the likes of Damian Lillard, Elgin Baylor, and David Robinson. But even outside of the All-NBA talent, you still have plenty of all-star talent all around the class. Starting off with Bam Adebayo, one of the best defensive bigs in the NBA with four all-defensive appearances and two all-star appearances with a complete game. Jared Allen, who's one of the most underrated bigs in the NBA, who was able to get his first all-star appearance last season, averaging a career high in points and rebounds. And finally, a name you'll probably be hearing a whole lot more in the coming years. Larry Markkinen, the seventh pick, who is dealing with a more than interesting start to his career, is now able to start anew in Utah to where he just earned his first all-star appearance, averaging a career best in points with 25 a game on his best shooting splits as a pro. Now, at the age of 26, he has got plenty of more time to keep giving the NBA his best play to eventually work towards an all-NBA spot and even more in the right circumstances. And remember, this class was only drafted six years ago, and there are plenty of people who are able to achieve the highest marks of the NBA already. But even then, you still have a plethora of mainstays on teams who continue to show how stacked this class is. OG Ananobi is still leader this year and an all-defense member. Markel Fultz, again, who we mentioned before, who we expect to come back to all-star status at his own pace. Kyle Kuzma, who turned himself into a consistent 20-point-per-game scorer this year. And even Derek White made his first all-defensive team this year. There's probably a whole lot more to talk about, but we'd be here all day. But when it comes down to it, we're looking at a group of guys who can continue to become perennial all-stars especially as the older stars start to phase out in the future of the NBA and with the level of play they're already showing us so far in their young careers I think it's best for now to again put them in the A tier alongside all the other young classes with so much more upside to show and already showing how much they have done in such a short amount of time we just got done talking about one class that absolutely exceeded expectations with the talent they have and how they went about succeeding so early in their careers. But the next year, you have them do it again in the 2018 class. How so? Well, it was headlined by the seven foot and strong as an ox, DeAndre Ayton. But as we all know, he hasn't done much on the team that he's on right now since he has been the main guy at all, leading a pretty underwhelming number one overall pick campaign. No, the main mystery of the draft was the six foot seven point guard from Slovenia, a European MVP at 18 and the basketball prodigy Luka Doncic. Even though he went third overall, people all over wondered just how this kid would translate the NBA with his unorthodox game, at least as a guard. And I only say that since the NBA is based on speed and agility. And Luka isn't exactly, you know, speedy nor that agile. Basically, if Jokic was a guard is the best way to describe it. But he was able to figure out how to dominate in the Euro League circuit at such a young age and an underdeveloped body. But as soon as he touched the NBA, everyone knew he'd be a star with LeBron light trajectory in his career, where in five seasons, he's already made four all-star appearances and four all-NBA selections and already led his team to the conference finals. Adding on to the fact that he's officially part of the 30 point per game club in NBA history, his pace is easily on that of Hall of Fame level or even best of all time talks in his position or this age if and only if he can go about winning championships and the like. But while already having a GOAT candidate in this class, how else can you talk up this class? Well, you can add more all-star level talent. The pick behind him and Jaron Jackson Jr. made his first all-star game this season with more incoming as he continues to improve offensively. But even with that, he came in with defense in mind and is already dominating on that side with two all-defensive teams 
games and leading the NBA in blocks twice in only five years of service so far. And you already know where we keep going. To add the cherry on top, he won his first ever DPOY title this year, averaging three blocks a game and almost leading the NBA in total blocks, even though he missed 19 games this season. From there, you still have first time all-star Shea Gilles Alexander, who improved year after year with the Thunder, with him this year averaging 30 points a game, over 50% shooting, which is absolute dominance and has plenty of more time in the NBA to keep up that type of play. And finally, the last all-star in this class, one of the best playmakers in the class, and Trey Young with already multiple all-star selections and all NBA selection last year and even then the class just keeps getting deeper. We're going to have to wait and see for Jalen Brunson to make his first all-star appearance in the coming years being a snub this season. Macau Bridges after being traded from the Suns to Brooklyn is now going to be looking for an all-star spot next season seeing how he easily turned into a first option after being traded and plenty of highly touted starters literally in this class. MPJ, Colin Sexton if he can shake off the injury bug he's been dealing with. Miles Bridges if he can avoid well domestic abuse cases deandre ayton eventually and plenty of more names so with that this class has achieved in such a small amount of time and how much they are projected to do in their careers how is it not fair to not put them in the a tier being led by a person people consider as a potential goat candidate and plenty of all-around talent year by year and other all-stars should only speak for itself how this class can do in a decade's time but in the case of this video they already shown enough to easily count them as a a tier class in their current form and finally to end things off the last class of the 2010s the 2019 nba draft class now outside of the primary prize and you know who experts once again gave their take about just how underwhelming the talent pool was or at least when it came to how they could see them turning out into something in the future but we'll talk about if they were right about that because the only person who can focus on as the number one overall pick and the prize of the draft is zion williamson zion has been followed all in the media ever since his time in high school but seeing how he dominated in college almost effortlessly, the NBA wanted a piece of that Zion pie. And the Pelicans were the lucky team to be able to have an offer of a lifetime. Until it wasn't, because even as Zion came in as a wrecking ball written all over him, the only thing the Pelicans had in mind was his weight issue and his potential lower body issues. And Lord and behold, it's all Zion has been dealing with since becoming a player in the league, only playing 114 out of 318 regular seasons season games with injuries in his lower body keeping him out of any real consistent play and keeping him out of the playoffs twice with his team when he plays in the actual game he's the two-time all-star people expect him to be it even led the western wins as the first seed at one point this season but when he's gone his team suffers immensely and i can't imagine what the franchise thinks as they even put a weight stipulation in his contract to incentivize good health as of now we know exactly what zion can do at his best but we haven't seen it for a long enough time to warrant any real talks about what he can do in the league but even with him dealing with his issues we still have someone we can crown as the best player in the class as of right now and that person is jaw gritty man morant who since his third season has shown the nba that he is a household name with electrifying plays and great team around him already being a two-time all-star and getting an all nba nod last season all of this in only year four but unfortunately, due to him doing something stupid again, he might even be jeopardizing his own career, just like Zion. Then to round out all the All-Stars, we have Darius Garland, who was rewarded for his valiant efforts, leading a very offensively struggling Cavaliers team last year who relied on him heavily for production, shot creation, and playmaking. And after being regarded as the worst player in the NBA at one point to becoming an All-Star level player, it's safe to say his rise became a surprise to some. But this is where the class starts to become more of a bore to some people, as this class talent wise wasn't the biggest to experts with a lot of role player like talent being taken in the lottery to try to get them to be the best versions of themselves whether that be DeAndre Hunter at 4, Cam Johnson at 11 or even a project like Sekou Demboya remember that name at 15 but there are some bright spots in the class at least to help out a little bit six man of the year Tyler Hero, Jordan Poole, Kevin Porter Jr, Keldon Johnson and a standout this year in the field goal percentage leader of the league and defensive menace Nick Claxton but of course there's ceilings can only go so high especially for the scoring guards in Jordan Poole, Tyler Hero, and Kevin Porter Jr. So as of right now we have a class with a large turnover rate with only 10 starting level players right now and three all-stars. That doesn't set a good precedent especially as we continue to wait to see how Zion even turns out with only a few years to work with 
and John Morant, of course, screwing up his own career. I, I, I might make a video on that one of these days. For right now, though, with so little production compared to other classes on this list, I will have to give this class a C tier even potentially a D tier if things keep going the way they are. I see more talent all around, or at least long term compared to the 2013 class, so I don't think it's 2013 worthy, but considering how this class turns out, this class can go right down with them. And even if you wanted to put them down there, I wouldn't even blame you for doing so. The 2010s decade from the draft perspective gave us a lot. MVP winners, Hall of Fame worthy talent galore, and of course, the plethora of all-star level talent, and even late bloomers. But after we look through those 10 draft classes, we always gotta remember that not all draft classes are created equal. Some have the ability to come together in a competitive and stat class to make for an amazing bundle of talent, and some are just known as for one guy, and not for much else. But as we look into a new age of the 2020s decade, we can easily see a change of culture in the 2010s draft classes. Play styles, and even more prevalent, more versatility on the court, something you didn't see in the early parts of this video, but you did see in the later parts. Now again, if you want me to do the 2000s decade tier list, be sure to give me 1,000 likes, and I will start working on that immediately. But of course, I hope you enjoyed today's video and learned something new, as my view for this channel is to inform and entertain. Check out my social medias for the Inside Life of Albini and other channel news. Check out my Twitch where I stream weekly. And if you want to talk to your boy, there is always my Discord. But with all that out of the way, this is your boy, Albini Linguini. Same piece.